I am Poor Boy Rice, and I'm a truly grateful recovering alcoholic. Hey, everybody. Sober one more day by the grace of this power that is so much greater than I am that I choose to call God. Fellowshipping with men and women just like you and trying to follow the directions for the program of Alcoholics Anonymous. I would like to take this opportunity to say happy birthday to Charles or anyone else who might be celebrating a birthday here this evening. And thank you very much for allowing me to be on your program. You people in North Carolina sure have been good to me in Oak Flow. And we love you with all of our hearts. Every time we've ever been to North Carolina, we have always enjoyed it. And I, again, I think it's only fair to tell some of you who might not know me that I'm a little bit old-fashioned and I'm kind of country -fied. And the only reason I share that with you is because you never would have known it if I hadn't told you. <laughs> I'm also glad to see this 12, 1,500 people out here this evening. <clears throat> I know that Buck is taping this, and I thought I might get one of those tapes and carry it back and play it to my home group. <laughs> because all they know is what I tell them. And I thank everybody I've run into up here this evening. I say, well, poor boy, I've already heard your tape, so, you know, I don't see no need in taking up a whole lot of time up here. You've already heard it. Uh, same old story. I haven't been back out there adding on to it, so you'll just hear the same thing again this evening. And I'd like to tell you my <clears throat> the story that I love so much because and moving around from place to place, I run into a lot of people, and I don't never know who they all are, and some of them might have known me before I got to this fellowship. And so I tell the story about this old buddy of mine. He lived over here in North Carolina, and he stole a man's milk cow, and they gave him 12 months in the chain gang. And when he finished his sentence, he moved down in Georgia. And he got him a job, he went to work, and he started attending a little old Baptist church down the road. And he established such a good record in the community and in the church until after a while he was elected to serve on the deacon board. And he served in that capacity for some time, and after a while the preacher resigned and asked this old boy if he'd be the preacher. And he accepted and on the first Sunday morning that he walked up in the pulpit to deliver his sermon, he looked down the aisle, and he saw a long-legged joker come walking in that he used to be in chain gang with. And that kind of messed things up for him, so he started his talk off like this. Now, brothers and sisters, I came here this morning fully prepared to preach to you from the book of John. But after observing this great congregation, I have changed my text to the second chapter of Jude, where it says, if you know anything, or if you seized anything, that ain't already leaked out, you just keep your mouth shut now to let it leak into the world. <clears throat> That's kind of the way it is with Poe Boy. And I did quite a bit of research before I found out there ain't no second chapter of Jude. <laughs> I don't know where that old boy got that from, but it worked. I'm also privileged to have this typical-looking little old silver-haired lady sitting here with me. She's my wife, and I call her Old Flo. Now, Flo ain't all that old. That's just a pet name. She calls me Old Po' Boy. <laughs> and every time I start to talk, Flo says, Now, uh, don't you tell them folks how old I am. I don't know what makes women like that, but that's just the way they are. 
And, of course, I respect her wishes. And I just say old Flo got here about the same time Kerosene did. <laughs> and, of course, that was back on in the days when castor oil was a wonder drug, you know, sort of like penicillin when it came along. But I think what I'm up here for is to share my experience, strength, and hope with you in order to follow the guidelines of the program of Alcoholics Anonymous and in that fifth chapter it says our stories. Disclose in a general way what we used to be like, what happened, and what we're like now. And I would just love to spend this, what little time I have up here sharing with you what it's like today. It's beautiful. My friends, this is not a dead end. This is not a dead, dull, boring, and gloomy fellowship unless I make it so. To me, it is very exciting. I really get excited about this thing. When I think about this God that I talk about, who loved poor boy Rice enough, that he picked me up off of the scrap pile. Nothing. And he gave me a new lease on life. Thank God. He gave me something worth living for. And the only message that I have to tote is my personal experience. And unless I have had an experience as a direct result of something that don't have a whole lot of meaning to me, and I come to find out a long time ago that personal experiences is the best teacher of all times. I was born uh, a little over 72 years ago down here in Rockdale County, Georgia. And that's where old Flo and I live today. Uh, I retired at the age of 66, the first part of 79. And all Flo and I had was our little old Social Security check, and we couldn't pay that high rent up there where we lived in Stone Mountain, so we moved down to Conyers. And we got us one of those little old government housing apartments. It's based on your income. And I can remember living in that county as a little old boy in an old house over in the field. My friends, I want to share something else with you. There's a difference between a house and a home. Because this little old apartment that Flo and I lives in today, it's a home. Thank God. We have each other. We have love. And we have God in our lives. And we have this beautiful fellowship that's called Alcoholics Anonymous. And all my life, I always got my needs and my wants mixed up. But today, by God's grace, and trying to follow the directions of this fellowship, my needs are being met, and I'm grateful. My old daddy, he was a drunk. He was a sharecropper, and he was a moonshiner. And I suppose by the time I was 10 years old, I could operate a liquor still as good as my old daddy could. I knew all the ingredients that went into a batch of beer that would cause it to ferment when it was ready to be distilled. So I learned this as a little old young boy. And it came in real handy later on, and I'll touch on that a little further along. And I think we were about the poorest folks in Rockdale County. And I don't know just how old I was, but as a young boy, my dad moved us to Atlanta. And we moved into a part of the city that they called Cabbage Town. And then, as it is today, it was a real slummy era. And I think every little old boy that I began to associate with or to run around with, he was a graduate from some reform school, or he was a candidate for some reform school. If he hadn't been, he's on his way. Now, we all know what it's like to be young at some time or another. We like to be accepted by the people that we're so closely associated with. And so it was with me. I wanted to be accepted by the other guys. And I began to do the things that they did. And I can remember some of these kids' dad would buy them an old bicycle. My dad couldn't buy me one, and I'd steal one. 
And after a while, some of these kids' dad would buy them an old hot rod, and my dad couldn't buy me one, and I'd steal one of them. So I always had just as much as the rest of the kids, but mine was all hot. Now, they don't do this down there in Georgia today, but they did back in those days. And when I was 16 years old, they had me up in that Fulton County courthouse because I found out that the law kind of frowned on some of them things I was doing. And I never will forget what that judge told my mother. And this was in March of 1929. He said, I'm going to send your boy to the chain gang and let him see what it's like out there, and then I'm going to turn him right back out, and I'm sure that your boy will be a better boy. And, of course, we would believe anything that anybody told us, especially the judge. And so I went off to the chain gang, and I expected to get out that night or no later than the next morning because that's what the judge told Mama. <clears throat> But it didn't quite work that way. They kept me four years. And so here again of mixing and mingling with the people that I was so closely associated with, wanting to be accepted, I had become a real smart aleck. Now, I got another name for that, too. I hated everything that stood for law and order, honesty, decency, and respectability. And that's the kind of person I was four years later when I came back out on the streets of Atlanta. I couldn't tell you how old I was when I had my first drink of liquor. I was probably in diapers. My whole family drank liquor. Everybody we knew drank liquor. And this was back in the days when there wasn't nothing but old moonshine, and we didn't see nothing wrong with it. A short time after being released from prison in a drunken stupor one night out on the outskirts of Atlanta, I wrecked an old automobile, and I killed Mama. And I never got over that for many, many years, and a long ways down the road. My God, that guilt. The nightmares, because I could hear Mama crying and pleading and begging, trying to get me to slow that car down, and I wouldn't do it. Out of smart Ellie. And it was my fault, and I lost my Mama. <clears throat> I think my mama was like many mamas even today. She upheld me in just about everything that I did. Her boy just couldn't do nothing wrong. And then like many young men even today, I took my mother for granted. You are my mama. You're supposed to do all these things for me. And I could remember so many times when she wouldn't have streetcar fare. And she'd walk in the snow or the rain down to this old chain gang camp to bring me a sack of bull Durham smoking tobacco and say, Mama loves you, and we hope they'll let you come home sometime. But this was Mama. Mama was supposed to do these things, so I took her for granted. And then I began to run with some of the worst people in this country. And a short time later, I was arrested, tried, and convicted, and sentenced to serve over 100 years this time. And so back to the chain gang I went. And my only hopes of ever being out again was to run out, and I run all my life. Run, run, run. I escaped, attempted to escape from every institution I was confined in except the last one. Some of these men that I was so closely associated with, were, well, they're not around today. Some of them were shot down and killed trying to escape. Some of them were killed out on the highway or the streets by all policemen, and some of them went to the electric chair. So, my friends, it is by God's amazing grace that this old drunk stands here and shares a little bit with you this evening. I violated every prison rule that they had. And, of course, this was back in the days when they used the old sweat boxes and the stocks, and they whipped me with everything imaginable. And I continued to get worse. You don't win people like that. And sometimes people say, well, poor boy, how do you win them? There's a simple little four-letter word that says... L-O-V-E, love. Thank God for this kind of love that I'm talking about. I've seen it move men that you couldn't move with a Thompson submachine gun. And this is what makes this fellowship such a great fellowship because there's so much love. There's so much understanding. There's so much identity here. 
Eventually, the federal government built a place down in Tattanoe County we call Reedsville, which is one of our state penitentiaries down that day. And I was one of the first convicts to enter that new prison in October 1937. The federal government built it and leased it to the state of Georgia and gave them 30 years to pay for it in. And the last year that Governor Eugene Talmadge was governor, he taken all the money out of the treasure and he paid the government off. And the next morning, the headlines in the Constitution said, the state of Georgia now owns a state penitentiary lock, stock, and electric chair. <clears throat> So they locked me in a little cell for eight months until they could open up a rock quarry for incorrigibles. And I was transferred over there, and I remained for three years in that rock quarry. But I managed to escape on two different occasions out of that quarry, and they sent me back to Reesville under what they call a stop order, never to be transferred out again. And I don't know how long it was, but it wasn't too long after that until we got a new warden down there. And out of 2,500 convicts, he picked 10 of us with the worst escape records and said, carry these men to maximum security. They'll never come back to population as long as I'm warden. We had a lot of friends and we had a lot of connections. And 30 days later, we escaped from maximum security at midnight. And we came downstairs and we captured the whole inside of the penitentiary. Now, this had never happened before and it's never happened since then, but it did happen that time. We're taking over the front office, the powerhouse, and the switchboard. And I walked down through those cell blocks with a market basket full of keys, and I turned everybody out that said they want to run away. I must have let a hundred out. So we threw that main switch, and we had a complete blackout. All the inside lights, outside lights, tower lights all went out at one time. And there was 25 of us went out those big front doors and taking cars off of the yard and left. And the other 75 that I had let out went down and broke into the commissary and got all that juicy fruit chewing gum, brown mule chewing tobacco, and they didn't want to run away, they just wanted to steal something that's full of larceny. <laughs> and the governor offered a thousand dollar reward, dead or alive, for every one of us. And within another month's time, I'd say we were all back in jail somewhere. And they started what they called an eight-ball squad. Our heads were shaven, and those old pick irons were welded around our legs, and we were placed out in a stump digging detail, segregated from the rest of the men. And every state trooper in the state of Georgia had to come to Reesville and do 10 days guard duty over this particular de detail that they might know these men anywhere on site. We were not allowed any visitors or any mail privilege, and of course we had no money, not even any lights in our cells. Life looked pretty hopeless in those days, and so many of these men began to break their legs and to break their arms and to cut their heel tendons, known as a heel string. And some of them crippled themselves for life. And so the word came back to Atlanta as how these men were crippling themselves, and the governor picked a group of men to come to Reesville to make an investigation and to report back up at the Capitol and recommend something to do about this. And he said, the state of Georgia will back you men up 100% in any recommendation you make. And so they came down, and we were driven out of these old muddy river bottoms into this old dark cell house. And uh, he had picked the president of the Senate to speak of the house, a lot of judges, probation officers, newspaper reporters, and photographers. And one other man I'll never forget as long as I live. His name was Mr. Wiley J. Moore. Mr. Moore was a millionaire banker in Atlanta, and the governor asked Mr. Moore to head up this group. Mr. Moore said, open the door. I want to go in here and talk to these men. And they said, you can't go in. That's too dangerous. And this was the first time in my life I ever heard anybody talk about God in a respectful manner. Mr. Moore talked about the God of his understanding, and he said he prayed before he came down there, and he was not afraid to go in there. And that got my attention. They let him in, and we followed him to the rear of this old cell house, and we sat down in a big circle, and Mr. Moore sat down in the center of this group with tears just flowing down his face. And he brought us a message. He talked about the God of his understanding. He said, you can't buy it, it's not for sale. And the most amazing thing of all, he said, you don't have to be good to get it, that it's a gift. 
My God, I couldn't understand that kind of talk. But I had all the respect in the world for that man because he was not a person. And for many, many years after that, I'd think about that message that man had brought us that day. And I wanted to be like that man, but I didn't know how to be like that man. That man was for real. He said, I'm going to let your hair grow out so you look like a human being. I'm going to take these old stripes and these old chains off of you. He said, I'm going to let you pick any job in this institution that you want that you can learn a trade that will be worthwhile to you on the streets one day. And he said, I don't care how many life sentences you are serving. If any man will just do five years with a good record, I promise you a parole. What an opportunity. As far as I know, there's only one other man in that group that's still living, uh, other than myself, that's taken advantage of that great opportunity. He did do five years. He was paroled. He's an old grandpa now. He never got back in trouble. But you know what kind of job I asked for? I asked for a job down in Stewart's department. Now, that's where they got all that meal and sugar and syrup and yeast. <clears throat> I, I intended to stay drunk, and I did. <laughs> and I have people today, they say, Poor boy, how in the world do you drink in the penitentiary? I got news for you there, honey. It was easier to get at Reesville than it is over in Rockdale County. You didn't have to walk as far after it. <laughs> and out here they call it beer, but in the penitentiary we call it buck. It ain't nothing but still beer. And, of course, I had learned this from my daddy as a little old boy working around Lickstill. And I could make it so strong, you'd almost have to have a chaser with it. So I stayed drunk. And I used this little extra privilege that I had of mixing and mingling with the other convicts and scheming and plotting and planning. And after a while, I got me an old pistol smuggled in there. And I got up there one morning, I enticed five other men to help me, and I was so drunk I didn't even know I was in this world. And we captured 19 of those free people and had them all tied up in haywire, used them as hostages trying to go through the gates with them. Now, I thought I wanted out bad, but my friends, I can honestly share with you this evening, thank God I didn't get through those gates that time because I certainly wouldn't have been living today. And anything that I tell you that happened to me, don't you feel sorry for me. I asked for every bit of it. You know, I was in this fellowship for a long time before I realized and accepted the fact that I am responsible for my own actions, where before I had always blamed people, places, and things for the condition that I had got myself into. And so they stripped me off naked, and I was beaten till I was blood as a hog, and I went to the death house. Right in the shadow of the Georgia electric chair for the next two and a half years for safekeeping. I was not allowed any visitors, and I couldn't have any mail, and of course I had no money. And if I ever got a cigarette during those two and a half years, one of those condemned prisoners gave me a cigarette. I saw an awful lot. Now, this didn't make a Christian out of me, but it certainly did change my attitude about a lot of things. Two and a half years later, I came back to population, and I had a thought like this. When I go again, I'll go out that front door, free man. I'll go out the back gate in a pine box. I can't beat you. I quit. And so in my way of thinking, for the next seven years, I made what I called a good record. Now, I stayed drunk most of the time, but I stopped trying to escape. And during those years, there were a lot of things that happened. A lot of them were real tragedies. And a lot of it was comedy. And I like to look at the humorous side of things. Uh, I had a little old buddy there. Most everybody had a nickname or something. I had a little old buddy there, and his name, they called him Hitler. Now, <clears throat> if there was anybody in Reesville that loved that old buck as good as I did, it was old Hitler. Now, Hitler weighed just about 75 pounds soaking wet. I pulled off a batch of that buck one morning, and Hitler got drunk and got out there in the hall and got arrested on a plain drunk charge. <laughs> And they had him down at the control office, and the warden said, Hitler, where'd you get that buck at? And he pulled his hat off, and he bowed over real humbly, and he said, Captain, he said, you can just whoop this old head of mine till it rattles like a pot of ochre if you want to, but I ain't going to say one word against my good friend, Po' Boy Rice. <laughs> 
But uh, <clears throat> old Hitler swore he didn't snitch on me, you know. He didn't know how they were. But then, as many other times, we'd have to go upstairs, eat bread and water for a few days, so it was just a merry-go-round. But I stopped trying to escape. And by this time, we had a pardon and a parole board down there in Georgia, and we had a board of corrections. Before that, all we'd had was a prison commission, which consisted of three men. They were the whole works in Georgia. And every year, the pardon and parole board would come down and interview me and make a recording of whatever my attitude was and carry it back up to the Capitol. But after seven years, the chairman of the board came down one morning and said, Pope Boy, we feel like you've been in long enough, but you've been too closely confined for too many years to be turned out with the public. I didn't know anything about World War II. I had no trade. And I realize today that that man knew a whole lot more about me than I knew about myself. He said, I'm going to recommend that they send you back out to a road camp and let you mix and mingle with the people out there. And when you get used to being around folks again, we're going to give you a parole. So sure enough, they transferred me up to Cobb County at Marietta, Georgia. And they told my sister, said... We're going to let him stay up there a year, and said he's just on trial, and if he does good for a year, then we're going to parole him. So I felt sort of like a misdemeanor then. I'd count the months and the weeks and the days off till that year was up, and they sent me a letter and said, stay another year. That like to have broke my heart because I was a real weak individual, and I didn't know how to deal with disappointment. I come to find out later on that they did this for psychological reasons to see if I could stand that little disappointment. And I almost missed the boat because I had an attitude like this. When my folks come to see me on Sunday, I'm going to get what little money they got and I'm going to leave because I very well could have left then. But all these years that I had been gone, my little old brother and sister had grown up. They had families of their own, and they had all become church people. I never could understand why they didn't talk to me about God. I guess they just thought I was a hopeless case. And so that morning as they came out there, and I was so bitter at the state of Georgia, and I wanted them to feel the same way I did. And they just dropped their head and began to cry, and I didn't know how to fight nothing like this. I like to look at it this way, all the way down through life, at different incidents, different times, there's some little seeds that were planted in that old heart of mine. Mr. Moore had planted one down there that day. My sister planted another one that morning. She said, I know you don't have a God. She said, I do. She said, there's an awful lot of people praying for you. You don't even know them. Please don't do anything till the capital opens in the morning. Let me go back up there. And I, had, I owed my sister a lot because she had run her legs off for many, many years trying to help me. But then, just like my mother... I had took her for granted. You are my sister. You are supposed to do all these things, so I thought. I promised her I'd be still, and the very next evening they said, Poor boy, you stay in here in the morning. Somebody's going to come get you and carry you to Atlanta. The pardon and the parole board wants to talk to you some more. I couldn't hardly sleep on that old bed that night for thinking about this God that my sister had so much faith in. Sure enough, they carried me up there. There's a lot of people up there. I didn't know them. They're just friends of my family, and they were up there trying to help me. And they said, we're going to reconsider, and we'll let you know what our final decision is in about two weeks. And I guess it was about two weeks, and I was paroled, and I'd been in 20 years, one month, and two weeks. I had no trade. I didn't know how to live in this society of ours. I had lived just like a caged animal for so long. And back in those days when you made parole, somebody would have to come and pick you up and carry you home and bring you some clothes to wear. And I never will forget, my sister brought me a sports shirt and a pair of slacks. And that was the first time in my life I had ever owned a pair of breeches with a zipper on them. Now, my friends, I'm going to tell you now, that really turned me on. <laughs> I'd catch myself standing in front of the mirror going, zip, zip, zip. <laughs> this is what I was like when I came home. And I went to live with my sister. 
And every time the doors of the church were open, my people all went to church. And it was sort of a take it or leave it position. Now, you can go with us or you can stay here by yourself. And so out of curiosity, I went. And I went for all the wrong reasons. I met a lot of wonderful people, people who wanted to help me. But a person who had lived like I had for so long, I had built that wall around me. And I didn't trust people, and I kept everybody at a distance. I wouldn't let people get close to me. So I refused the help that was offered me. But there's one good thing that came out of me going to meet, and this is where I met this little lady, Flo, here. And a short time later, Flo and I was married. We rented some furnished rooms, and two men in that church got me a job digging ditches for a plumbing company. I'm a good ditch digger. And I went to digging ditches, and me and old Flo would go to meeting on Sunday. And I kept on digging ditches, and after a while, they gave me a dime raise and made me a plumber's helper. And I stayed with that, and after a while, I got me one of those little old cards that said that I was a journeyman plumber. And I went out to Emory University, and I got me a job as plumber. And I worked out there for two years. And during this time, I was not drinking liquor. You know, that book tells us there's a time in our drinking careers before we advance so far into this disease of alcoholism that we can quit on our own if we have reason enough to. And I had good reason then not to drink. And so I was not drinking. And one morning they called me in the office and they said, Poor boy, your past is caught up with you said, uh, we can't work a man with your record at the university out here. We're going to have to let you go. So here's another big letdown, and I'm a real weak individual. I just couldn't understand these things. So I got full of anger. I got full of resentment. And that old attitude came back, I'll get even, that I had lived with most of my life. And that old false pride wouldn't let me go home and tell Flo what had happened. She would have understood, and we could have worked it all out. Every morning she'd put that bread and meat in a sack, and I'd leave like I was going to work, and I didn't have a job, and I didn't want a job. I was full of resentment. Now, we all know what that book says about resentment. Being the number one offender for an alcoholic, it said it destroys more alcoholics than anything else. And so the way I started getting even was drinking that stuff again. And after a while, I'd be in such a condition that I had too much respect for Flo and I wouldn't go home. And most of the time, I'd walk the streets of Atlanta all night and cry and feel sorry for poor boy. Poor, pitiful, and put upon. Don't nobody love me. Don't nobody understand. Anybody here ever felt that way? I don't want you to think I had self-pity. <laughs> and it wasn't too long I couldn't go home because the police was hunting me. And I knew I was going to have to run. And I wanted to see Flo just one more time before I run. And I got my brother to pick Flo up and bring her out to meet me. And we went out to a little old motel out there where South 75 is. We spent the night, and the next morning was Sunday morning. And I walked up to the bus stop with Flo. And I stood there, and I... I watched Flo get on that bus going back home. Lord, I wanted to go home with Flo so bad I didn't know what to do. And I thought the most precious thing I've ever had in my life, and now I've blowed it again. And I heard a church bell ringing. And I looked across the road over there, and there was a church, and I saw a lot of happy people getting out of those cars going in. And the thought came to me, and I asked myself this question that I have asked myself so many times. Why can't I be like other people? Why do I have to be this kind of a person? My God, I've asked myself that so many times. And I run. The problem was I carried the problem with me, and it was poor boy. And that's where the problem had been all the time. And, of course, that liquor in these other states is just like it is in Georgia. And a few days later, the police picked me up in DT's just as crazy as a bat. 
They called Atlanta. They sent and got me, brought me over and put me under a $10,000 bond. My people put up the home, everything in the world they had to get me back out of the streets, walk the streets and feel sorry for poor boy. I'm an alcoholic. We talk about the geographical cure. I had that attitude, maybe I can go somewhere else and start all over. And I'll run again. Run, rabbit, run. Run, rabbit, run. Same old merry-go-round. There's nobody mine just that got out of penitentiary. We've been very closely associated for about 50 years. Him and I was drunk going up that four-lane highway towards uh, Chattanooga. We was right along there about Marietta one evening. It's dark and raining. Both of us drunk and old beat up forward. We had a flat tire right across the road from a filling station. We went over and bought a tire, and the man said, pull your car over, and I'll put it on for you. And so here we are trying to get that old Ford across that expressway. And there was a Thunderbird deal, and his family from up in Ohio was on the way to Florida on vacation. And they run over us and tore up our car. And like two idiots, we jumped out and took theirs away from them. <laughs> now this, to me, is the insanity of alcoholism for this drunk. That just looked like the normal thing to do at that particular time. But, of course, we didn't get by with that either. And it wasn't so much as what really happened, but because of our past. And they tried me and that old boy, and they'd give us 20 more years apiece. And, I, him, and old, him and I went back to Reesville. Flo didn't have nowhere to go. She went out to Piedmont Hospital and got a job working from 11 at night till 7 in the morning. Sleep in the daytime, write me a letter once a week, and beg somebody to bring it to see me every three or four months. If I'd have had the nerve, I'd have cut my throat. I couldn't see no way to live 20 more years in there. And I didn't know how to pray. Thank God Flo did, and I'm sure a lot of other people did. And I like to look at it this way. Somebody, God heard somebody's prayer because about 14 months later, they transferred me up to Stone Mountain, Georgia, where they're building a new prison camp. And they sent me up there to put the plumbing in that new prison camp. And we finished that new prison. The warden called me out on the front. He said, Po oh boy, I have a different assignment for you every Sunday afternoon. He said, we're going to have a church group from all over this era. They'll be coming out here holding services. And he said, I want you to stand by that door and welcome the visitors. He said, I'm going to get a bunch of song books, and I want you to lead the singing. He said, I want you to go back there in them bullpens and form a choir out of those convicts. <laughs> <laughs> now, I know this sounds silly, but you know I wanted to do what that man asked me to do. I really did. I look at it this way. These little seeds that had been planted, they had begun to sprout. And they were just about ready to come to the surface. Thank God, one day, they blossomed out in the program of Alcoholics Anonymous. I don't believe in straddling that fence. You know, our book tells us that half measures avail us nothing. Of course, I didn't know that then. And I wasn't in no shape to do what that warden asked me to do, and I found me an altar. And it was an old black burnt hickory stump out in the woods. And I'll never forget it as long as God lets me stay in this world when I drop down on my knees by that old stump. And I said, God, if there is a God, whoever you are and wherever you at, I give what's left old poor boy to you. I ain't going to run no more. I'm tired. I'm tired of that old way. Something happened, my friends, because since that day and since that hour, I've never wanted to rob, steal, or kill nobody since then. But I'll share something else with you. He left me an alcoholic. And I hope I don't ever see that day that I think I'm cured. My friends, when you read in that big book more about alcoholism, and it says that this is a progressive disease, and that it always gets worse and it never gets better, please believe it. How do you know, poor boy? Personal experience. I went back in there, and I did what the warden asked me to do. I welcomed the visitors. I led the singing. I formed the choir. 
And the good Lord sent one of those honky-tonk piano players in them, and I put that joker to playing gospel music and formed a quartet. And the warden let me go out in the front yard with bulldozer, and I built a baptizing pool and run hot and cold water out there. Uh, we turned it on. You know, I still had that number on the seat of my britches, but I felt different than I had ever felt in my life. Old folk had come out there and sat in those services out there. You ought to heard some of my singing. Man, it was kind of a cross between George Beverly Shea and Tiana Red. <laughs> <laughs> but I like to try, try doing it, and I did. And I like to look at it this way. This God of my understanding don't have to be in a great big hurry about anything. I did that for the next five years. And one morning somebody said, Poor boy, I just seen old Flo go around the corner up there with your Sunday britches and it like scared me to death. I thought some of Ken folks had died and maybe they'd got a court order and I was going to the funeral. But I come to find out somewhere there between six and seven years they had paroled me again. And Flo had come to carry me home. We knew where our help come from. We couldn't hire a lawyer. We didn't have a dollar and a half between us. But we knew where our help come from. I went back to work at plumbing work for the next three years, and then I got involved with a big church and a gospel singing group. And for the next three years, we did this. And so here's six years. I'd been on the streets out there, and I hadn't drank. And then I taken a job at a motel as maintenance man. And, of course, the liquor and the beer flowed very freely with all the conventions, Shell Oil Company, Standard Oil Company. And I ain't got sense enough to know I'm an alcoholic. You know, I thought I can take it or I can leave it. Man, I ain't drank nothing in over six years. One day I decided to drink one of those good old cold Budweiser's. And I did. And I wanted another one, and I wanted another one, and I didn't get drunk that day or that night, but I kept on till I did get drunk. That's why I know it's progressive, because the first drunk I got on was worse than the last drunk or any other drunk I'd ever been on. And I went down and got down drunk, and I stayed down drunk for one solid year. My God, I know that feeling of helpless, happiness, hopelessness, despair, terror. I know it from A to Z. I had never in my life been so full of fear as I was the last year as a practicing alcoholic. So didn't know what to do with me. Nobody knew what to do with me. They said, put him over in uh, Peachtree Parkwood. They'll cure him. And back in those days, they had a little deal going around. They thought they could tape you off, taper you off. And the first three days you was in there, every two hours around the clock, they'd give you two ounces of 180-proof alcohol and a little fruit juice. Now, honey, you better believe I'd be standing at that nurse's station every two hours to get my medicine. <laughs> and then all them pills is rolling at me. So I went in there drunk and come out drunk. And we'd spent what little money we had saved up, and the insurance was all gone. And from then on, I'd just have to go wherever they'd take me. My God, I made the round of all of them. The last alcoholic hospital I was in was over at GMHI. And I'm sure it would have been the same old merry-go-round with the exception of one thing on Monday night. There's a group from down there in Rockdale County where I live today come out there to hold an AA meeting. And when they announced it on the loudspeaker, once again, out of curiosity, I went out there and sat in that meeting to see what these cats are putting down. And I'd been over there about three weeks, and I was shaking so bad I couldn't hold a cup of coffee. And at the end of that meeting, there's a very dear lady friend of mine who runs a rehab place down there in Conyers today. She came over and said, Poor boy, do you want to get sober? And I said, Yes, ma'am, I, I sure God do, but I don't know how. She said, I'm not going to tell you how to do it, but I'll be glad to tell you how I did it. Now, that got my attention because here's somebody going to share with me how they did something. 
She gave me her telephone number, and I think that was the most important telephone call I ever made in my life because I called Sue. And Sue got the little meeting book out, and she looked up the closest meeting to where I lived at in Stone Mountain at that time. And she said, they got a meeting over there tonight. Now, you get yourself over there. And I went, scared, plumb to death, very skeptical, very doubtful. I didn't think anything in this world would work for me. And then I had a good case of that uniqueness. I just didn't think there was anybody in this world like me. That was my feelings. I come to find out those people didn't care nothing about who I was and they didn't care where I came from. They said, do you want to stop drinking? And I said, Lord, yes. And they said, you're in the right place. Sit down and shut up. <laughs> After a while, I got up nerve enough to ask them old boy, I said, what do I have to do to be like y'all? They said, don't drink and go to meeting. Now see, if they'd have told me anything more than that, I didn't have sense enough to know what they're talking about. And they know that. And that's the reason they didn't tell me no more than that. But I'd hear those guys and gals say, My name is so and so, and I'm an alcoholic. And I thought, My God, if that's what an alcoholic is, what in the world am I? <laughs> now, I know there's people, a lot of people come to this fellowship and they have trouble with step one and two. I didn't. I didn't, because I made a decision that first night, if this is what an alcoholic is, I wanted to be an alcoholic more than anything in the world. I didn't want to be what I was. <laughs> now, my friend, I've come to find out this is a program of action. And so I didn't drink, and I went to meetings, but I didn't take the necessary action. I didn't use these tools of this fellowship that was offered to me. I got the wrinkles out of my belly and I got to where I could eat. I could lay down at night and I could go to sleep. I could get up in the morning, put my britches on and go to work. Flo got to treat me a whole lot better. My kin folks got better. And I said, thank God, sanity is returned. After a while, they made me secretary of the group, and then I thought I owned my own group. <laughs> and I went on and I celebrated the birthday. And I did this for about a year and a half. And those meetings started getting a little bit dull. They started getting a little bit boring. And I'd catch myself sitting in a meeting, and there's one man in that group in particular, I was very critical of that man. Because in all his sharing, he would tie it in so beautifully with what the big book of the 12 and 12 says. I didn't like that. I didn't like that at all. I didn't want to talk about that. I almost got drunk. I didn't want to get drunk, but I almost got drunk. And I couldn't understand why. And then I found my answer in that big book. Because it tells me that if I'm an alcoholic, and God knows I am, that there will come a time when I'll have no effective mental defense against that drink other than this power greater than myself. And here I am standing out there all myself, by myself, and I had nothing to grab to. But right in the nick of time, sitting in the parking lot in front of a liquor store, I prayed and I said, God... Please take this craving for that stuff away from me. That's been a long time ago. He took it away and it hadn't come back yet. And for that I'm grateful. But that scared me so bad I went back and I got me a sponsor. Because I had argued about sponsorship. I had argued about a four-step inventory. And guess who I got for a sponsor? This man that I was so critical of in the beginning. Because I knew that man walked just like he talked, and I knew that man would tell me the truth, and he did. He said, Poor boy, said, I've seen you celebrate a birthday. Now, what's the big deal all of a sudden you want a sponsor? And I said, Well, my program ain't working too good right now. 
He said, oh, yes, it is. Your program's what got you to our program, and it's called Alcoholics Anonymous. Now, if I'm going to be your sponsor, let's get rid of your program before you get drunk. <laughs> and he said, I don't think we can fix something until we find out what's wrong with it. And he's the man that got me into a four-step inventory. And would you believe I found some flaws in my personality? <laughs> they were there all the time. But blinded by this old false pride, I simply refused to look. Had I not got me a sponsor, I would have never got into that book. Had I not got into that book, which is a program... I would have got drunk and I'd have been buried a long time ago. I'm a firm believer in good sponsorship. That man sponsored me, and then in that fifth step, I talked to that man about some things I thought I'd care to the graveyard with me. All these steps are spiritual, but my friend, that fifth step, I had a spiritual experience there. He cried, and I cried, and we hugged each other's neck. Now, that old boy got transferred later on. He's down in Mississippi now. But I got me, well, I got two now, and neither one of them hadn't been sober as long as I have. But I learned from my first sponsor that what I look for in a sponsor is quality and not quantity. Because I've seen people who have celebrated a whole lot of birthdays that didn't have this quality of sobriety that I was trying to get. Yes, I wanted what you people had and what this program had to offer me. I see it's 9 o'clock and I want to share this with you in closing. There have been so many good things that happened to this old man since I came into this program and started to live by these spiritual principles. Several years ago, <clears throat> I received something that don't many people ever get down in the state of Georgia unless they can prove their innocence. But I received a full, unconditional pardon after being on the street for 13 years. Free, free, thank God, free at last. First time I'd been free since I was a little bitty boy. You know, I'm a registered voter now. If I just had sense enough to know who to vote for. <laughs> and any time that I'm in a meeting, my mind is always centered on that newcomer that's coming through the door. Because I remember one day when I came through those doors, so full of fear, so suspicious, so skeptical. And in closing, let me share this with you, my friends. And this is based upon personal experience, which is the best teacher of all times. That the problem ahead of you, John, I don't care what it is, it is never, never, never greater than this source of power that I've been trying my level best to share with you here this evening. Thank you, thank God, and happy birthday.